Good morning, everyone. What a great day to be a pediatrician. What an amazing day we've had. I am so honored now to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Luz Towns Miranda. She is a clinical psychologist and an expert on how trauma impacts children. For more than three decades, Dr. Towns Miranda has dedicated her life and career to achieving optimal outcomes for children who have been victims of trauma and toxic stress. She has been on the front lines serving on the New York State Psychology Board and conducting custody evaluations of indigent families for the family and Supreme Courts of all five New York City bureaus. In addition, she has served on the faculty of the Departments of Psychiatry and Social and Family Medicine at Albert Einstein's College of Medicine, as well as the Trauma Specialization Certification Program, Committee of the Postdoctoral Program of Psychoanalysis and Psychotherapy at New York University. She is an educator, an advocate, and just as importantly, an engaged and passionate parent, partnering with her husband in raising two children. Her daughter, Lucita, a successful businesswoman, and her son, Lynn Manuel, who none of you know, who, <laughs> who created the Broadway shows In the Heights and Hamilton, and has won a Pulitzer Prize, three Tony Awards, two Grammys, an Emmy, and a MacArthur Fellowship Genius Grant. And I will tell you, she is one proud mother of both of her children. From her unique perspective as a psychologist, a child advocate, and a mother who helped her own children attain their dreams, Dr. Towns Miranda will illustrate the power of nurturing positive bonds with children and outline what pediatricians can do to encourage the best possible outcomes for all children and all families. I have had the opportunity over the last day to talk with Luz and have gotten to know her from all of these perspectives. I think she defines Wonder Woman. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Luz Towns Miranda. I just remembered my son does this all the time. <laughs> so thank you so much for your kind invitation. Today is my 39th wedding anniversary. <laughs> so I start my celebration sharing with all of you my thoughts on one of the most successful products of my marriage, raising thriving successful children. Most of my conversation these days starts off with two questions. How proud of you are your son, of your son, Emmanuel? And the other one is, how do you raise a genius? So to the first one, I say, if I'm playful, this much. <laughs> and to the second one, how do you raise a genius? It's tougher, but if, we re if a reporter gives me only 10 seconds, I am forced to say, by singing to him, by relating to him, by guiding him, and by being a mom who's always available. For those of <laughs> For me, this is not a new question. Way before Lee Manuel was met by all of you and got the MacArthur Genius Award, through my decades as a child psychologist, I've been asked countless times how to have a successful outcome in raising children. As pediatricians, you have a front row to the behavior of your young patients and their caregivers, and therefore have a unique opportunity to help foster healthy bonds between children and the adults in their lives. Attachment, weak or strong, anxious or secure, will have a lifelong impact on an individual's relationships and manner of relating in the world. So my plea to you is to be on the alert to encourage and support good attachment patterns that you witness in your well baby visits and subsequent care of children. This book in particular is huge. I urge you all to get it. There's a great DVD in the back. 
The fact is that there are all kinds of factors in a child's upbringing, some within our control and some not, that determine his or her outcomes. What I do know is that it is nearly impossible to turn out happy and well-adjusted adults if you do not enjoy a healthy, secure bond with your loved ones from the start. Attachment is the beating heart of every relationship between a child and caregiver. I cannot overstate the importance of attachment and its sister concept, nurturance, in the development of, well, of the well-being of children and adults. Parents are key, caregivers are key. But in your practices, I'm sure you see a babysitter, a grandmother, a close friend, and also important adults in your children's lives. For Lin Manuel Mundi, the person who he immortalized in his musical In the Heights in the role of Abuela Claudia, was an important figure who helped him develop a healthy and secure bond as well. Abuela Claudia was not a babysitter, she was his grandmother. Abuela who encouraged him, who indulged him, who kept secrets from my husband and me of things he was not supposed to do, who was always there. Uh, but for my daughter, it was my mother who served that role. The important thing to remember is that a healthy bond in childhood, what we call a secure attachment, is a prerequisite to becoming an independent, well-adjusted adult. Children who exhibit curiosity and a desire to learn new things, who are happy to engage with strangers, enjoy a secure bond with their caregivers. They are sad when the caregiver leaves, but they enjoy the security of sensing that he or she will return and are happy when that happens. Limanuel loved getting on the little bus with Connie that took him to the local daycare and loved getting back home to one of us, my husband, Abuela Claudia, or me, waiting for him at the corner. Secure attachment may look like an unhealthy codependency, but the opposite is the case. Through secure attachment, children develop the self-esteem and sense of efficacy that they need to thrive. Attachment types are visible and predictable at four months because within days, an infant develops a predictable repertoire with his or her primary caretakers. The type identified at four months is predictable again if there has been no intervention in the mother's repertoire with that child. And you'll learn all that in that book. <laughs> I urge you to get Dr. Bibi's book. In it, you can see the different interactions that are captured in simultaneous videotapes that have chronicled the different types of attachment. All of you interact in your personal lives based on the attachment pattern that got established between you and your primary caretakers in that first year of life. Attachment comes in four types, secure, anxious, avoidant, and disorganized. And by year one, that attachment pattern is established. You are in a, in a position to intervene and steer your children and, patterns and pa pa parents toward a more secure attachment. Let's not get alarmed. Children who have any of the other types of, of attachment can also be successful, but the quality of the attachment ultimately does affect whether an individual reaches their optimal potential and is able to derive fulfillment and pleasure from their pursuits. Let me speculate on someone who has been dead for a while, but is an ever-present member of my family now, Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> for all of his accomplishments, he had many, but he could not be satisfied, no matter how much he accomplished. I've pondered his psychology, which is riddled with trauma and loss. That he managed to channel his brilliant and trauma-driven ambition to such heights, have, have a strong family despite betrayal and loss, is attributable to a strong attachment to his mother that was likely an anxious one given her precarious social standing and dire financial straits. I'll tell you a story. When Lee Manuel was a child, I tucked him into bed each night and engaged in a variety of activities at bedtime. He would tell me about his day, his friends, his activities. Then I would read him a story or tell him a family story about him, his sister, me, 
for his dad. I often sang him to sleep, although my voice is not very good even in the shower. I have been asked to stop singing by good singers as I can drag them off key, <laughs> especially if there's any harmonizing. Row, row, row your boat is a source of hilarity for my family as I struggle to maintain the family. Some of you may have seen some on YouTube that my son posts. But young children don't know that a voice is wonky. Songs soothe children, and especially infants. My awful singing may not be appreciated by adults, but it has been my go-to to calm a child when he or she is in distress. When Lin-Manuel and Lucecita and I'd sing, I'd, I'd sing often, softly, and repeatedly until they fell asleep. My singing repertoire included April, April Showers, California Here I Come, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, Mammy, a wide range of non-nursery songs. So when Lin-Manuel went off to college, he called that fall and said he was having difficulty falling asleep and asked whether I could uh, record some songs that I used to sing to him when he was little so, so that it would help him sleep. Who does that? <laughs> I'll tell you, a child who felt securely enveloped in the voice of his caretaker. And indeed, in his four years in college, his four years of college were a time of personal growth and independence and accomplishment for him. In fact, it's where he wrote and mounted the first production of In the Heights. He came home during winter break and locked himself in his room and began writing songs for the fledgling musical. Even today, he often comes home to the house to write songs, knowing he has been generative there. It's a place that nurtures him. I already told you that we have a new family member, Alexander Hamilton. Bear with me as I use him as a, as a subject through which to think about attachment and nurturance. Strange, I know, but between my immigrant roots, my clinical career, and my husband's contagious obsession with musical theater, the Mirandas live and breathe the intersection of art, history, politics, and psychology. And let me note a few more things before I convince you that a founding father who died a century and a half before the first publications on attachment theory has something to teach today's pediatricians. A crucial piece of, a crucial piece of secure attachment is that parents and caretakers be nurturers. Secure children are explorers, trying out new things, and eager to learn. Their security can only last when they know that they are supported and encouraged in their exploration. Nurturance is, more, is about more than just supporting our kids' interests. It's about endorsing them. Yes, showing up at the soccer games and the school plays, doing the carpools, all that is support is important. But you also have to tell your children, your passions are worthy, your efforts are worthwhile, I believe in you as a person. Because if you don't, who will? Limanuel obviously had a passion for music and performance from a very early age. At Christmas, when he was two, he insisted on singing the 12 days of Christmas to everybody that came to the house. And he would say, he'd answer the door, I know the, first days of, uh, the 12 days of Christmas, and would just launch into the song. That little. I have yet to teach my three grown, uh, older grandsons the 12 days of Christmas. His sister, Lucecita, always loved numbers and went on to engineering school. Imagine if out of pragmatism, we had pushed Lee Manuel into a law career as my husband initially wanted to, or if we had nudged Lucecita towards more stereotypical feminine pursuits. Perhaps they would have been successful, but our bond might have been weakened. It's true that we are lucky, and a big part of parenting, frankly, is luck, but it's also true that we supported and endorsed our kids' passions and strengths, giving them the security and space to thrive and strive in their chosen paths. Now, back to Hamilton. Clearly, our ability to delve into his psyche is limited by the centuries that separated us from him and the considerable differences in the culture and custom of our era and the early republic. But thanks to the tireless work of historians like Ron Chernow, whose biography of Hamilton inspired Lin-Manuel to write the musical, 
we know enough about the man to see how his story is relevant to the concerns of caretakers and professionals who work with children. Young Alexander's father, who was never married to his mother, abandoned him at an early age. Then when he was 12, his mother fell ill and died. It goes without saying that traumas like these disrupt attachment and have a hugely detrimental effect on children if other caregivers do not step in. That said, it is worth noting two important things. One, despite leaving the family, Hamilton's father never denied that Alexander was his, was his son and even signed letters to him as coming from, quote, your very affectionate father, unquote. Two, despite their hardships and the fact that angelic in schools would not accept pupils born out of wedlock, Hamilton's mother took great pains to ensure that Alexander received an education. These displays of care and devotion matter. They mattered in the 1700s, they matter today, and they will matter as long as we humans are around. When Lee Manuel was in preschool at age four, in the spring of that year, he powerfully befriended the daughter of a friend of ours who was his age. He would greet her with a kiss when he arrived, so she was his girlfriend. Sadly, she drowned accidentally. I vividly recall entering his room the early morning of the day he would be going to school and she would not be there. I gently told him that she had died and he would never see her again. He immediately understood and burst out crying. He was deeply affected and sad for the remainder of his time in that school, especially upon arriving and not having her to greet or say goodbye to at the end of the day, they would kiss goodbye as well. If he was asked, as some people ask young children, do you have a girlfriend? His face would fall and he would quietly say, my girlfriend died. He once told me during those years that he was never getting married again. He, he was that pained. The impact of the early loss had its expression in one of his first, in, in actually his first musical that he wrote in high school, because his high school allowed students to write their own plays, he wrote a musical. The short musical had a major character that had a near-death experience due to an allergic reaction. During the development of In the Heights, which was produced by the same producers of Rent, he was acutely aware that Jonathan Larson's Rent, Rent's composer and author had died before his play became the cessation of his generation. And yet, Le Manuel worried and wondered if he would live to see his play succeed on Broadway. So not surprisingly, In the Heights had a significant death. Hamilton the musical presented the impact of different losses, conveying through artistic expression how individuals cope with betrayal and death. Without this early experience, Le Manuel might not have been as attuned to the resonance of the impact of early loss. And the slightest details matter too. I once asked Emmanuel what would have happened if he had been raised by one of his aunts instead of me and his dad. And he said, Mom, I wouldn't be on Broadway. He is aware of how my husband and I have nurtured and fostered his passion in theater. As I said at the beginning of my conversation with you, attachment patterns are observable and established at four months of life and repeat observations at one year typically yield the same result. Dr. Beatrice Beebe has dedicated her life to the microanalysis of mother-infant interactions. Mothers and infants are observed interacting with each other face to face. And then the video is analyzed second by second over a two minute period, it is astonishing. The ability of the mother to connect visually, verbally, and tactilely matters. The mother that connects with the infant typically mirrors the child's expression and vocal rhythms. If the child becomes distressed and restless, she waits and follows or tries to soothe the baby in effective ways. With the other less optimal forms of attachment, the disconnect, overstimulation, or repetitive and ineffective efforts are painfully visible. 
In fact, the first three years of life are the most important in the formation of these bonds. Many, you, many of you, I have no doubt, are familiar with the pioneering work of John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth, from which our understanding of attachment and nurturance are drawn. Their work with infants help us to understand that the behavior of the caregiver is the largest determinant in the child's attachment. Adults who are consistently, and sen are consistently sensitive and responsive to a child's needs help those children develop healthy, secure attachments. But where caretakers are not dependable, when, where their responsiveness is inconsistent or worse, non-existence, babies may exhibit a range of less healthy attachment patterns. And while you obviously can't be with your parents' patients around the clock, you do have the opportunity to observe caretakers' behavior. If a, getting over a cold. <laughs> if a mother acts embarrassed or is apologetic for her child's crying during an appointment rather than soothing that child, that's a red flag. If an exasperated caretaker tells you his toddler is simply bad, that is a red flag. If a child is extremely nervous around you even when the caretaker is present, that's a red flag. Or if a child exhibits no reaction to his or her caretaker leaving the room, that too is a red flag. All of these behaviors, whether on the part of the adult or the, or the child, are evidence of absent or unpredictable responsiveness from the caretaker. Anxious attachment manifests in children who are generally incurious and nervous around strangers and highly distressed when a caretaker leaves and yet ambivalent when he or she returns. These children are obviously insecure. They do not fully trust their environment or the people around them, even the adults with whom they are closest. By contrast, avoidant attachment develops in children who are initially instinct, whose initial instinctual efforts at bonding with the caretaker are rebuffed or ignored by that adult. The child quickly learns that his or her emotional needs will not be met by this person and heartbreakingly maintains a distant, cool demeanor with a kind of, as a kind of defense mechanism. And often think of the noncommittal guys who don't want to get married or probably have avoidant attachment. The final and more disturbed type of attachment pattern is disorganized. We observe disorganized attachment often in children who are abused or severely neglected or whose parents are seriously mentally ill. The disruption in their lives produces children who simultaneously strive to connect and comfort and distrust and turn away from it when it comes near, whether from a, a known adult or a stranger. Without intervention, it's nearly impossible for these children to form healthy attachments. I scarcely need to tell you what a crippling effect this inadequate attachment can have on a child's development as they grow to navigate adolescence and eventually adulthood. Indeed, researchers following up on Bowlby and Ainsworth work have shown through longitudinal studies how the attachment behaviors observed in babies carry into their relationships in adulthood. As one might expect, secure attachment in early life breeds adults who have healthy self-esteem and can establish relationships that balance intimacy and independence. On the other hand, anxious, avoidant, or disorganized attachment often leads to adults who struggle in their relationships or are incapable of maintaining healthy bonds. They often end up in unstable, dysfunctional, distrustful, codependent, or even abusive relationships. I don't want to start off your morning depressing you. <laughs> On the contrary, my hope is that you will be inspired as medical professionals, that you feel empowered to observe your patients' behaviors and advocate for them, that you use your front row seat to children's development to teach and inspire. Of course, a pe pediatrician's job is not to act in loco parentis, and there are ethical boundaries, as well as there should be. Perhaps the message is to be aware that to pursue connections with your fellow doctors that allow you to share best practices. After all, at the risk of using a cliche, it takes a village. 
babies learn about themselves through us. This mirroring effect matters. Children have themselves reflected back to them through the mirroring, mirroring process. That is how they begin to learn who they are. When we are indifferent or reluctant to engage with the world, they will be. When we are anxious about new experiences and sensations, they will be. When, but when we are affectionate, available, and open, they will be too. More often than not, it is a matter of educating parents and caretakers, not lecturing or chiding them. That is the role that the pediatrician, pediatric community can play in rearing healthy children. When you see a depressed mom or caretaker, you'll likely see a depressed child. One in seven mothers suffers from postpartum depression. Helping that mother access resources to alleviate her condition will foster the healthy development of the child in your care. Beyond what pediatricians can do in the exam room, it is vital that doctors do not shy away from social responsibility. AAP is to be commended for recognizing and embracing the fact that the profession exists for more than just seeing to the children's physical health. The mental and emotional well-being of your patients is just as important. In that vein, the organization merits praise not for, for not shying away from contentious issues. You acknowledge the detrimental effects of the flawed immigration policy, of gun violence, of entrenched poverty, and of climate change. These social problems are entirely relevant to the issues of attachment, for no matter how devoted and responsive a parent is, factors outside of his or her control can disrupt a child's sense of security and therefore her ability to form healthy attachments. When the government deports loved ones, tearing families apart, children's development suffers. When families have to fear that their child will be shot in their own neighborhoods, children's development suffers. When loving parents have to work multiple minimum wage jobs and still struggle to put food on the table, children's development suffers. When dangerous pollution clouds the air or increasingly frequent weather, extreme weather events ravage communities, children's development suffers. Though some in the scientific community would prefer to sit on the sidelines, it is absolutely imperative that scientific expertise, data, and evidence be brought into the policymaking process. I again applaud AAP for standing up. In fact, let's return to Alexander Hamilton for a moment. He too did not hesitate to stand up for his principles. You could actually argue that he might have been a bit too fond of a fight, but the important thing is that he knew he had a responsibility to the greater good, and he embraced that. Whatever nurturance and caring he received from his mother before she died must have worked. Young Alexander learned enough empathy to see the evil in the slave trade and become an outspoken abolitionist. That was hundreds of years ago, but the same principle applies to our relationships with children today. In speaking up for immigrants, in taking, on, taking a stand on issues like gun violence, climate change, and health care reform, you are making a difference. You are telling your patients and their caregivers that you care not only about curing that cold or administering that vaccine, but about helping them lay the foundation to prosper in life. Who knows, maybe you have the next little Hamilton on the other end of your stethoscope. When Lucecita and Lee Manuel were born, and even in my wildest dreams, I could not have imagined how wonderful, successful people they would become but I am the happy and proud, and proud of the bond we share and the values we stand for. I close by saying something that you already know. Children are not simply miniature adults. That said, the nurturance and attachment modeling that they receive in their youth, really from the beginning of their lives, has a profound effect on the men, men and women they become. The job of forming healthy attachments is about being there for kids, honoring their feelings, supporting and endorsing who they are. The importance of these behaviors simply cannot be overstated. Not all children will grow up to form new nations and have art made about them centuries after they pass, but I believe passionately that all children can grow up to be healthy 
happy, and open-hearted. Do not throw away your shot. For all that you do to help families form healthy attachments and raise happy kids, I thank you. And my family thanks you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Towns Miranda. Awesome. Wow. And you blow us all away.